Right, well, welcome to the Upper Virtual Book Club. Um, Fran Leibowitz said that the best fame is a writer's fame. It's uh, enough to get you a table at a good restaurant, but not enough that you get interrupted when you eat. Now, I'm not sure that's true of our guest today. I suspect we'd all quite happily interrupt his meal. After all, few historians have over a million followers on Twitter. For those of you who aren't in the know, William Dalrymple is arguably one of Britain's greatest historians. I first came across his work when I was gifted the Wolfson Prize winning White Moguls, the book that became instrumental in my own personal journey towards understanding my mixed British Indian identity. That's what led to both not half. I'm also incredibly grateful to Amandeep, um, of course, for the honour of hosting today's conversation. It means, means a great deal to me. Uh, William's other works include the Duff Cooper Prize winning Last Mogul and the Hemingway and Kapuscinski Prize winning Return of a King. He's written and presented three television series. He's been awarded five honorary doctorates. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, the Royal Asiatic Society, the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Put simply, he is writing royalty. But his crowning moment perhaps was in uh, 2018 when he was presented with the prestigious President's Medal by the British Academy in recognition of his outstanding literary achievement and for co-founding the Jaipur Literature Festival. But he didn't stop there. In 2019, he released his most ambitious work to date, which we are discussing today. The Anarchy, the relentless rise of the East India Company, or as it's known in India, the Anarchy, the East India Company, corporate violence, and the pillage of empire. Please join me in welcoming William Dalrymple. You're very kind, Jasser. I'd swap it all for a place on Peaky Blinders, but we'll <laughs> I, I thought I'd give you some applause since we don't have any applause today. Um, I want to kick off by uh, doing what they say to never do, which is to judge a book by its cover. Uh, <laughs> the uh, two different covers for two different markets. On the left, we've got uh, the cover that was released in the UK, um, where we have you know sepoys standing attentively to attention, and then on on the right, we've got um, the cover that was released in India um, with a very different subheading as well and um and conflict ensuing do you think this i think i just want to start here because i feel like this perhaps reveals britain's discomfort with its imperial past and i was wondering whether that was something you were looking to address um when it came to writing this book i think you're absolutely right jessa i mean this of course is not uh, my uh, decision with um covers and and titles and subtitles the author suddenly finds himself in a very different world from the interior of the book where you are king more or less, but with the cover, uh, you are at the mercy of marketing departments, publicity teams, uh, and multiple board meetings where, where people decide. And the bigger the book is, I mean, the more they hope to sell, the more, the, in a sense, that their influence uh, gets uh, the final say. And there is, in fact, a third cover, which you haven't got here, which is the American one, uh, which yeah. has the third picture. Uh, and uh, but also the one that uh, Obama was reading, I guess, when he had picked it as his well, favorite book of 2020. Interestingly, not uh, Obama uh, when he put it down uh, with his um, uh, books of the year uh, actually chose the English. Uh, oh, really? Sometimes. So I suspect he picked it up on a kind of uh, sitting on uh, in, in in the VIP lounge in Heathrow or something, like that, <laughs> where he got it. But he 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 was clearly reading the British uh, the British edition, and the subtitle didn't put him off. But right. uh, what I can assure people is that the, the inside uh, is identical in all the editions. There's no uh, different text for different markets. It's, uh, it's the same message. Uh, and frankly, I, I, at the end of the day, I think any author is probably uh, uh, quite wise to take the advice of his publishers that they have better ideas what's going <laughs> to smell than, than not. And the key thing is to get read. But you're right. There is, uh, I think, you know, there's a, a huge denial in Britain about empire, uh, about everything to do with uh, the, uh, not just the Raj, but the British Empire as a whole. And um, it, I mean, for those of you, I, I see from the hellos coming up on the chat that uh, uh, people are watching this from all over the world. And I think those not in Britain will be astonished to discover that the British Empire simply doesn't feature on any uh, UK history syllabus. Yeah, I, it's not something that I never came across at school. It's your your work's been um, sort of the real the introduction that sort of led me to seek out other stuff. Well, I think it's a real problem because British kids move from the Tudors, from Henry to Hitler, uh, and they the only things they they learn in between that have an international thing is a little bit about Will, uh, William Wilberforce and the abolition of the slave trade, and then there's a bit of Florence Nightingale and the uh, and the Crimean War, 
I said, the impression is given that, that the British are always on the side of the angels, that, we're, we're, that you know, we fought the great anti-racist battle against the Nazis, that we got rid of the slave trade. And so British kids are brought up smugly believing that you know, their ancestors were rather heroic and did nothing they should be ashamed of. Um, and everywhere else in the world, people learn a very different story about, in every continent, people learn stories about British troops coming, taking the freedom of whether they're uh, Australians or, or uh, um, South Africans or Canada or America uh, or India. And I think it's a, I think it's a, a really dangerous situation where most British people do not know about the Irish potato family. They don't know about um, uh, the, the horrors that followed the 1857 uprising and the, uh, you know, the 100,000 at least people that were innocent people who were uh, gunned down by British troops in the retributions that followed. And as a result, the British habitually misjudge their place in the world. They, they, they don't understand how other people see them. So, and that showed most obviously after Brexit, when the first thing that happened was that Theresa May took a British delegation of businessmen, including vice chancellors of universities. I mean, a really big, massive, uh, starry delegation of the pick of uh, a British industry uh, and uh, education and so on, defense, all these different sectors came with her. And the idea was, you know, we'd pissed off the French and the Germans, but the Indians love us, we'll go back to India. And this was literally labeled in Whitehall, Empire 2.0. I'm not making that up. That no, yeah, I remember seeing the headlines, yeah. Is what they called it. And of course yeah. they arrived and it, and it went down into a tailspin within a day when uh, uh, Theresa May got to meet Modi. And when Modi learned that she wouldn't be giving any more places at university or any more visa, uh, 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 no flexibility on visas for Indians coming to Britain, he just shut down the visit. And I actually ended up being invited to dinner that night with some of the vice chancellors. Um, the, the, the then Minister for Education, Joe Johnson, was a friend from when he lived in Delhi. And it was like a funeral. I mean, all these people had come out all the way to India in order to make this triumphant reassertion of, of the old friendship between India and Britain as they saw it. Uh, and of course, they just, got a, they just got a bloody nose, went home with nothing. Mm. And so I think well, this is you know, really one of the reasons I wrote this book um, was to try and teach the British that particularly, it, it's particularly clear with the East India Company, which is the first two thirds of the story of the British in India. Mm -hmm. Because you know, there is no uh, question of this being done for philanthropic reasons. I mean, there's a whole school of thought in Britain whereby the empire was basically a sort of extended uh, save the children fund mission to you know, yeah. feed the starving children of India. Um, and with the East India Company, it's particularly clear uh, that well, we should begin. Much... Um, we should we should begin some of the, some of this teaching and, and dive into where we where your book begins, which is an unlikely an unlikely location. Um, really, it's a, a castle in Wales. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about why we begin? I confess I didn't look at your slides before I before uh, starting this, and I'm I'm seeing already that they're much better than my slide pack. I'm going to have to. <laughs> I can send it to you after. Don't worry. <laughs> Uh, well, that magnificent picture of Powys Castle uh, on the Anglo-Welsh marches um, is where I start my book. And it, it may seem a rather surprising place to start uh, uh, a talk about uh, the conquest of India uh, by a commercial company. Um, but it is actually very significant because this is Powys, one of the most beautiful, one of the most British looking uh, buildings you can imagine, rising from Tudor box hedges uh, to this gorgeous crenellated castle. Uh, but step inside uh, and you find something uh, quite different because inside powers is room after room of imperial plunder and loot loot of course being a hindustani word to plunder it's funny because i would always like i grew up with my um <laughs> with my um dadiji always saying like oh like saying he just like he took that thing or, or look and i never got associated lot with, with, the, with the English word loot. Yeah, of course. No, well, like so many, like so many uh, words from certain areas of, it, of, of, of uh, the English language, notably things to do with textiles, which is what the British were in India trading initially, where you have hundreds of words like pajama, taffeta, and so on, uh, which are borrowed, uh, cumberbund, all these sort of things borrowed from, um, from Hindi and Hindustani. So loot is one of the very first words that enters the English language. Why? Because it described what the British were up to for quite a lot of time in the 18th century. And uh, what we're looking at here is we're actually peering through Sirajah Dowla's palaquin. This was the palaquin he abandoned on the Battle of Plassey 
uh, when he was set up by his bankers, the Jagat Sets, who were these, who were like the Rothschilds of, uh, of India, these incredibly powerful bankers, who were uh, paying both the East India Company of Clive and uh, the rebels uh, uh, of um, uh, uh, under Mir Jaffa uh, to fight um, uh, and, dis and, and in modern parlance do regime change, to get rid of Siraj Dalla and replace it with uh, someone more acceptable to the Jagat Sets. And in the course of the battle, the, the palanquin is left there and you can see through the glass of this palanquin to the rest of the room, which is full of elephant armor, talwars, shields, ivory chess pieces, uh, bits of Tipu Sultan's throne. In fact, more uh, Indo-Islamic uh, loot and plunder, more Indo-Islamic artworks than exist uh, in any one collection in India, even the National Museum of Delhi, even more than the museum in Lahore. Uh, nothing like it in Afghanistan or Bangladesh. Uh, and here it is sitting in a private house in the Welsh countryside. And to me, that represents um, a whole side of the British uh, presence in India that we've wiped from the memory. This, this fact that we went there uh, and that we um, took so much back through loot, plunder, and asset stripping. And as you enter that treasury, this is the, uh, the, the picture which sits above the doorway leading into the Khazana, the treasury uh, uh, at Powys. And what it shows, as you can see in this picture, is a powdered, periwigged, slightly plump English gentleman in a red frock coat receiving a document from a Mughal emperor sitting with cloth of gold. Now, it's not a great picture. This is not no great masterpiece. The um, uh, Benjamin West, the painter, had never actually been to India, and this was a kind of imagination, um, imaginative reconstruction of a far more sordid scene that actually took place in uh, on a, an armchair covered with a sort of fancy cloth of gold covering that turned it into a throne that had been raised on a dining room table in Clive's private tent. And there the defeated Shah Alam, who had just been, um, uh, just been defeated at the Battle of Buxar, along with his two allies, uh, um, the, the new Nawab of Bengal and Shujo Daula, the Nawab of Abad. In other words, three great Mughal armies coming together to try and stop the East India Company. And instead, uh, to their own uh, enormous horror, uh, they were defeated narrowly, but defeated uh, comprehensively in the end. Uh, and the East India Company finds itself in complete control of North India. And this document, which is, if we just go back, this, uh, just, uh, just, uh, just to the, this document that's being handed from Shah Alam to, uh, to Clive is called the Diwani. Now that isn't a, a, a word that means anything to anyone really, either in India or in Britain today. It's a old Persian word, but what it, I suppose, translates into modern English, this document is a document of um, involuntary privatization. What's happening is that Shah Alam is giving over the rights to tax, mint, and economically police the three richest provinces of his empire. Now today in India, we think of, I suppose, Punjab itself and Maharashtra and Gujarat probably is the three richest provinces of India. In the 18th century, uh, perhaps surprisingly, it's Bengal because Bengal is the center of the textile trade and specifically the cotton trade. Uh, and there are one million looms in Bengal that between them are producing a great deal of the massive export uh, uh, products that uh, together cumulatively mean that India under the Mughal, under the late Mughals, um, creates about 40% of the world's GDP. Now, when the East India Company is founded, Britain is producing 1.7% of the world's GDP, not Britain, England, because Britain hasn't been created yet. This is before the Act of Union. It's just uh, little England sitting there producing 1.7% uh, 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 of, uh, 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 of the world's GDP. Now, what is happening with this document is that Shah Alam is handing over, not to the British government, and this is the crucial thing, not to the British government, but handing over to a private corporation the right to tax it. And after this document is signed and it becomes law, the East India Company swoops in and a tiny group 
of a few thousand British clerks, supported by uh, an Indian mercenary army gathered mainly from UP and, uh, and Bihar, and astonishingly, largely paid for by Indian bankers, because from the beginning, the Mawaris, but also many of the big bankers in Allahabad and Patna, uh, support the company. Why? Because the company is a corporation and it speaks the same language as the bankers. And they know that if they lend to the corporation, whatever else happens, asset stripping, looting, plundering, wars, famine, at the end of the day, though, the corporation will repay the loans uh, in full with interest. And, uh, and this ultimately, you know, they're a business. So they lend to the company, the company recruits an Indian army. And the extraordinary trick that the company pulls off is for, uh, for a, it, it uses Indian money borrowed from Indian bankers to raise an Indian army staffed by North Indians from Bihar and UP. And it creates an army that by 1799 is exactly double the size of the British army. And with this brown army, there are you know, only what, one or 2% or maybe 5% by, by the 1850s, uh, white officers running this. With, a, with, with this 95% Indian army, they defeat Tipu Sultan, the Marathas, the Mughals, Siraj Daula, and all the other rivals. So that by 1803, they're at the banks of the Sutlej, and all that's between them and gaining uh, the whole of India is uh, Ranjit Singh's Punjab. Uh, I think which is remarkable is that um because i think we're going we'll go and dig into some of this in a bit more detail um but just to bring up the next slide is that all of this was orchestrated out of uh, a very small building um a few offices yet again jasa you've got a better slide than i have i think i should get you as my picture researcher on my <laughs> <laughs> oh gladly gladly <laughs> it, it, it's a, that is indeed the east india company headquarters those of you that know London, that's now underneath the Lloyds building in Leadenhall Street in the city of London, uh, about sort of half a mile from the erotic gherkin, uh, which glowers seductively over the, uh, uh, over, over the London uh, uh, skyline. And look at it, it's just five windows wide. It's not even the two buildings, the two buildings on either side. Um, it's just the five windows in the middle. And one of the things that the company does is its headquarters is unbelievably lean and tightly run. A hundred years into the history of the company, there are only 35 employees in that building. Mm -hmm. And long after the company has taken over three quarters of the richest country in the world, it's still operating out of this one very modest shop that you could walk past uh, and not think twice. If you look, it's actually set back slightly from the street. You see the, the railings that are stopping the people in the foreground. Uh, walking into the property. So um, it's, it's set, set back, it's discreet, it's smaller than the buildings around it. Uh, but like, if you like Doctor Who's TARDIS or something, inside there is the machinery for the destruction of India. And again, just to emphasize, uh, it was not the British army that conquered India. It was not um, uh, uh, anything to do with the government at this stage. We'll, we'll come later on to how the government came to have so uh, more. I guess the obvious question then is, is how did this company come come into being? Like, how did it? Um, how did the story begin? I guess, and uh, I think it's and this it, guy here is the answer. Smart. So, it, it like any company, it has a founder, and this is the founder. This is the guy called Customer Smythe, Sir Thomas Smythe, who I suppose is the Richard Branson or um, who's the Kingfisher guy, M Malia. Um, he's, he's one of these sort of slightly dodgy, flamboyant, entrepreneurish <laughs> businessmen. Uh, and his dad has made a fortune before him, and he then makes a fortune uh, importing currants from the Greek islands, which apparently is a big thing in Tudor cookery, um, and a good source of sweetness at a time when there's no chocolate around, uh, or Mars bars, or lion bars, or, or gulab jamuns, or anything. <laughs> and, that would be my, my go-to. <laughs> And so, uh, so Thomas Smythe uh, makes a, a fortune uh, by founding something called the Levant Company with a few mates. And he uh, starts trading in spices, which he imports from Aleppo, Cairo, and Venice. But then in the late 1590s, he is in a, he's in a um, trouble because the Dutch have found that they can go around the Cape of Good Hope 
and they can get the spices cheaper, fresher, and uh, with much less bother by sailing all the way to Indonesia and buying them directly uh, from the uh, fr from the producers. Uh, which means that uh, that uh, Smythe's Levant company is basically out of a job. So what does he do? He he appeal he vents a new business model. While the Levant company was a, a group of rich merchants clubbing their capital together and founding a company and buying a few ships, the uh, company of uh, London merchants trading with the East Indies, which is the initial title of the East India Company, uh, is a joint stock company. And this is, in a sense, the great legacy, uh, for better or worse, uh, of the East India Company, because they're the first joint stock company. There's been two or three before, including one called the Muscovy Company, which trades with Moscow. But this is really the first uh, joint stock company, which realizes that if a whole load of individuals put their money down, and this list on the right is the initial subscribers, uh, ranging from the uh, uh, the mayor of London, who's the first name, who puts in two hundred pounds. You can see the second guy has contributed a thousand. Uh, a few pages on, it, though, it's people who describe themselves as vintners or hosiers or haberdashers. In other words, small London businessmen, and they're putting in a fiver or a tenner, uh, worth a lot more in those days. And uh, and they don't have to play any executive role in the business. They don't have to have board meetings. Uh, they don't need to do anything other than invest their money and then take a share of the profits. And this is exactly what happens. Uh, so there's no mix of mix of people from all walks of life that that contributed. So was it, was it a success from the off then, or, or, or? so it? I mean, in retrospect, because we know the East India Company is a huge success business-wise, it makes fortunes. But at the time, there's no indication that's necessarily the case uh, because at this point, 1599, the year that Shakespeare is writing Hamlet. Um, while the Portuguese and the Spanish already have massive empires uh, and control great chunks of Latin America and are shipping gold and tin and silver back from uh, Colombia and Mexico, um, the English have really done nothing. They've got one failed colony uh, on the coast of America, which hasn't, uh, uh, they've, uh, they've, they're just about to found Virginia, uh, which will take a lot of the investment that could have gone into the East India Company. Um, and this guy, Sir James Lancaster, who's chosen to be the captain of the first fleet, has, has just come back from a trip to the Moluccas. He got there, but he didn't get back. He, he sank his fleet uh, on the way home, and many of his men were eaten by cannibals. Uh, and he managed to ha he managed to sort of hitch a lift from another passing ship and make it back eventually yeah. to England. Uh, so, no, in other words, it, you know, there's absolutely no guarantee at this stage that the company is going to be able to even bring a single peppercorn back from Indonesia. Mm. But they buy a good ship. They buy a first. They buy a pirate ship, actually, which has been previously. Well, it been had a glorious ship. name, didn't it? Yeah. It the... had <laughs> had been called uh, the uh, um, was it the Scourge of Malice? Uh, <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds like something from a Johnny Depp Pirates of the Caribbean film. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they renamed it um, the Red the Red Lion, as if it was just a sort of pub on the corner somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. And they sail off. And initially, it doesn't go very well. They get they get stuck outside uh, the um, uh, the just in the in the channel because there's no wind. They set off in the middle of summer, and everyone comes and laughs at them and says they're never going to make it even to France, never mind to Indonesia, the Moluccas. But they do set off. They do make it. And as they're approaching the Moluccas, they see a Portuguese carrack coming the opposite direction. And um, everyone's asking about whether the can cannibaling is a myth. That could easily be a myth. I don't know for sure what happened, but uh, certainly the James Lancaster crew was killed by uh, angry islanders on the island that uh, 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 sank it. Anyway, they, they see a Portuguese carrot coming in the opposite direction. And as Sir James Lancaster's crew are very largely uh, pirates, they simply jump on the Portuguese ship, um, uh, uh, throw the sailors into the water and decant the cargo of spices from the Portuguese ship into the English one, then sail home. Am I right and in thinking I'm, that this sort of act, these acts of piracy became condoned? Is this where it was, it was sort of the word wasn't pirate, they were known as privateers, I, I think. Absolutely right. And uh, they, had, they had royal charters. So the kind of, you know, the traditional English behavior at football matches has a long uh, uh, sort of ancestry uh, in, in, in privateering and uh, and this sort of uh, national talent for thuggery, then it, of course gets channeled into into further empire building throughout throughout the next. I'm also curious. I, I included this image on the right because it was one that really struck me when I was reading the book. Uh, was 
basically to try and figure out how the British were viewed in India at the time. And there's there's the the, um, the tropes and the uh, of um, miniature paintings, which I hadn't I didn't really know. And there's something to do with the way in which um, James the First in this image is is positioned, which suggests how low down the agenda the English were at this time. Right. So what you've got here is uh, Jahangir uh, handing a book to a Sufi. And this is Jahangir shown, uh, the art historians tell us, as the millennial sultan. This was all, you know, rather like the, we all got excited about the millennium bug uh, as the millennium approached. Uh, so uh, Jahangir was seen as this sort of figure on the cusp of history. Uh, and uh, he's sitting on an hourglass with the sun behind him, with putties floating around. And the, the idea is that uh, Jahangir, who actually, as we all know, was a bit of a drunk uh, and uh, could barely stand up most of the time. Um, is is shown in this picture by the sycophantic artist handing a Quran to the Sufi and, and being the very epitome of piety and uh, uh, and wisdom. Mm -hmm. And the point is that he's ignoring the outstretched hand of the Ottoman Sultan, who's the slightly smaller figure uh, in the middle, and he hasn't even uh, dare he hasn't even deigned to look at James the First, who's sitting in that silly hat at the bottom. And James the First is given no more prominence than the artist himself, Bichita, who's shown in the left corner holding his picture um, uh, at the bottom of the audience chamber so uh, in other words the you know the, the under in, not not as an act of uh, deliberate snubbing just you know the English weren't very important they weren't important so there was no reason really to believe that when the East India Company was founded really that it was anything remarkable or important it was just another exactly we, we should you know avoid that uh, temptation to read history backwards uh, and and you know start from the position that uh, uh, the British rule the waves and uh, and uh, the empire which never uh, on which the sun never set um, mm. uh, was always there. It wasn't. Uh, the British were peripheral to Europe. The, you know, the rich countries were Spain and Portugal, largely because of imported gold and silver from the New World, uh, followed by France and uh, Germany, uh, or, or the, Ger the different German states, followed by, no, sorry, France and Holland would have been the, the next, because Hol the, the Dutch had this very successful trading world and banking world this is the age of rembrandt for example yes yes um, there was a nicholas mice um, exhibition at the national gallery recently and you saw all the imperial elements in the background there were maps and sort of um i guess persian porcelains and and it was uh, it was remarkable to see how that history is really captured in the art of that period it's like this is when people are really thinking about their imperial legacy Absolutely. And uh, the and the Brits are on the edge. You know, it's an agricultural country. We have a very successful wool trade, uh, which is making money for the people of Somerset and Norfolk. Uh, sorry, not Somerset, Suffolk and Norfolk, which is why when you go to East Anglia for a weekend, you see all those gorgeous wool churches, and those big guild halls. But in general, you know, Britain is way down the wealth ranks, even within Europe. Uh, and it is, in fact, the East India Company on one hand and the Caribbean slave trade on another that kickstart the economy, that create the capital, which then goes into the Industrial Revolution. And that's what puts Britain by the mid 19th century uh, into the forefront uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the world economy. But at this stage, we're an agricultural yeah. nation on the periphery of things. I guess it, and, with, in relation to India, it's sort of, I just, um, so I'm just very conscious of time now, um, <laughs> is that uh, how did this transition happen where the Mughals didn't care about the English and, and then suddenly there's this shift the moguls seem to fall from power and fall from grace. Correct. Um, so on the left the you've, got, <laughs> you've got Akbar hand, uh, holding one of his multi-religious discussion groups. He's got a couple of, uh, of uh, Goan Jesuits perhaps on the left, maybe a Sunni and a Shia beside them, Hindus, Vaishnav and Shaivite, uh, uh, Jains, Jews from Cochin, all of these uh, people gathered by Akbar. And it is this multi-religious um, attempt to, to bring all the different peoples of India together that creates the, the power and wealth of the Mughal Empire. And this is destroyed by Aurangzeb, who's the middle picture, sitting on his charger with his elephant, with his uh, sort of horse armor, uh, and, um, the, and this kind of wonderful um, uh, uh, halo around his head. And Aurangzeb, Initially, he's very successful. He overthrows a couple of the Deccan Sultanates, uh, Bijapur and Golconda, uh, but then unleashes the power of the Marathas from their fastness uh, at their, their uh, 
uh, citadels, uh, there's magnificent Maratha forts, which uh, if anyone hasn't been listening, has not gone uh, to visit uh, uh, up in the guts. It, you've got a great treat ahead of you, one winter journey. Uh, and uh, so the Marathas rebel uh, in the Deccan uh, and soon a burning uh, Surat, which is the big Mughal port. Uh, meanwhile, the Sikhs are gathering their strength in the Punjab. Uh, and here we have your namesake, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Baba Jassa Singh Aluwalia, uh, the bearded one, uh, <laughs> as opposed to the, 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 uh, the film star. And, uh, uh, and he's at this point, I suppose, gathering the missiles of the Punjab uh, in resistance against the Mughals. So what you see is this period of history, which uh, was called in both Persian and in European accounts of the time, the anarchy, hence the title of this book, when what had been a unified, centralized Mughal state uh, uh, with four million men under arms shatters and fragments into a fragment of, uh, uh, or, or into a, a series of rebellious polities. And the final thing that happens in the 1739 is what we see in front of us here. Uh, Muhammad Shah Rangila, who's a kind of cross-dressing playboy who loves music, incidentally a great fan of the, uh, the sita, which had been a Punjabi folk instrument up until this point when uh, Muhammad Shah Rangila introduced it to court, but left adept on the battlefield. And at Karnal in 1739, 1 1.5 million Mughals are defeated by a mere 60,000 Persian cavalry of Nadir Shah, who's the guy with the hat on the right. And Nadir Shah wins because he's got the latest military gizmo, which is, called, which is this sort of uh, massive horse-borne jazale um, called the swivel gun, which can pierce Mughal armor. And in a single action, uh, he, d he destroys the Mughal crack troops, uh, he then invites um, uh, uh, Muhammad Shah Rangila to dinner. The idiot goes, uh, and at the end of a very nice dinner, he's arrested. Nadia Shah rides him into his own city the next day, and six weeks later, he leaves with the Kohinoor, the Peacock Throne, the Darya Noor, the entire Mughal treasury, and 6,000 wagons filled with gold and jewels. And this is the money which has been used to keep the Mughal state together. It pays the army, it pays the bureaucracy. Without that money, the thing collapses. And it, it, the Mughal uh, empire shatters in a matter of years into this fragmented world where every single town in Rajasthan, Jaipur, Udaipur, Jodhpur is its own state, where Tanjore is fighting uh, the Nawab of Arkut, where Hyderabad is fighting the Marathas, and it's as if you just take a big Baroque mirror and toss it out the window and it shatters into a, a, a thousand pieces. And it's that, it, I mean, it, this has two effects. First, culturally, this is great because suddenly you have the money in Jodhpur or Jaipur. You don't send your taxes off to Delhi. You build yourself a wonderful uh, bar hall. You uh, import the best artists and Norch girls and gorgeous musicians. Uh, and this produces a cultural flower. The 18th century is one of the great periods of, of Indian cultural history. But in terms of military might, it's a catastrophe because uh, you have a whole load of um, uh, uh, competing polities rather than one big- I guess it's all fight. created a, a, a void, or I guess a, a market for military services. Exactly, you know, Jasmine. You, you've, been, you've been reading all the right books. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> And this, lot, this, this picture looks like a sort of gay pride parade in Madras, but it's actually, this is the cutting edge um, uh, uh, military hardware of the mid 18th century. And these guys in their natty little shorts that look like they've been imported by French Vogue uh, are in fact uh, the first European trained infantry troops. Uh, and this new form of cavalry that involved taking ordinary uh, fighting men, uh, not the big sort of, you know, uh, heavy cavalry from posh families, but these are just ordinary fighting men. You train them, drill them, teach them to file fire, use muskets. And in 1742, I think it is, uh, the, uh, the, uh, in just south of what's now Madras, these troops are put into battle against the Nawab of the uh, Carnatic uh, troops. And I think it's 600 sepoys defeat 70,000 cavalry. And for the next 30 years, these sepoy infantry troops are the cutting edge 
uh, the absolute last word in military technology. And it takes 30 why, years. Why, why was it that the, the, the Europeans were so advanced when it came to warfare? Um, I think it's something interesting because I've just been reading um, Frank Pan's Silk Road, which I know you reviewed and I'm a big fan of. And he says that, um, you know, at this time or in the period leading up to this in Europe, the concept, he says, the concept of violence was institutionalized. European art and literature had long celebrated the life of the chivalrous knight. In 1500, there were 500 political units in Europe. In 1900, there were 25. So I guess Europe had been tearing itself apart and it, there was sort of an arms race within Europe, which meant that Europe were far ahead. Specifically, there is something called the, uh, the War of the Austrian Succession. And the great star of this is uh, Frederick the Great of Prussia. And he basically invents this form of warfare using infantry, not cavalry, using a new form of muskets. And also, you know, the Enlightenment's going now in, uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, and so he uses science and you get ballistic experts, um, you know, doing sort of uh, uh, geometrical maps of how a shell can land and, and how uh, getting the right charge and getting the right... Uh, 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 elevation and cannon and, and moving them around battlefield can completely change a battle. So science is applied to war by Frederick the Great. And by the end of the War of the Austrian Succession, every European country has realized that warfare has changed forever. And so when Sir Roger Dowler in this picture um, marches down to take Calcutta uh, in uh, 1756, um, he takes it perfectly easily because the, the sepoys are not in Bengal yet and uh, there's only the old style of warfare. He marches in, he takes uh, Calcutta because the East India Company has rebuilt its defences without his permission. But he has a nasty shock coming because completely unknown to him and completely unrelated to his attack, the British government has sent out a Navy Marine force out to India because they've had intelligence that the French have uh, sent out a fleet. The fleet arrives, uh, the British fleet arrives off Madras to find there's no sign of the French. In fact, the French had gone to Canada. Uh, anyone that's seen the last of the Mohicans, it's that war uh, where you've got Daniel Day-Lewis running around, uh, you know, with tomahawks and all that sort of stuff. Um, so the French have gone off to North America. Clive arrives all the way um, uh, to, uh, to, to Madras to find he hasn't got a battle. Then three days later, the news comes of the fall of Calcutta. So he just sails his troops up the Ganges. He retakes Calcutta. Uh, the Seven Year War then is formally uh, uh, declared. He, so he attacks the French headquarters in uh, He's Chandigarh. remarkably young at this age, isn't he? He's, I mean, this painting makes him seem like a this seasoned... Yeah, of, he's, uh, this is, yeah, this is, this is exactly the man. Uh, he's, he's, I think he's in his 30s. Uh, he's already uh, fought a series of campaigns in his 20s in the Carnatic. He's gone back, he's, he's tried to be an MP, and now he's come out for a second spell in India. And as luck will have it, the Seven Year War is about to break out, so he's got a great uh, fleet of, uh, of Royal Navy Marines behind him. They, they take Chandanagar, and then this crucial thing happens. The Jagat Set, the big banker of Bengal, who's invented very clever financial mechanisms for... Um, for moving money from Bengal to Delhi uh, and taking a cut of it on the way. Um, so the Jagat Set just writes to uh, uh, Clive and says, um, listen, I want to get rid of Siraj Dowler. He's threatened to circumcise me if I don't lend him money. I will pay you two million pounds personally, and I will pay the East India Company a further two million pounds if you get rid of Siraj Dowler. So Clive doesn't even bother checking with anyone. He just goes north. He fights the Battle of Classy. The uh, main general on the other side is also in Siraj Dowler's pay, Mir Jaffa. And uh, they replace, uh, Siraj Dowler is killed and murdered. Um, and next day, Clive walks into the Murshidabad treasury and simply helps himself to all the gold and jewels. He then helps himself to 40 boatloads that he can't put in his pockets and punts it down to Calcutta. And that is the fortune which begins the East India Company's move from being a very successful trading organization to being a, uh, a, a, a military uh, force. Uh, seven years later, they fight the Battle of Buxa against Shah Alam, that, uh, that image we saw earlier of the Diwani. And by 1765, 
1975, the East India Company controls most of North India, most of what's today UP and Bihar and Bengal. Um, and um, this up because I thought now would be a good time to talk about your your um, your Guardian piece um, from earlier <laughs> in the year about about Clive because there is a statue to Clive that is up um, in uh, outside. I think it's the the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Correct. Um, and you don't think he should be there now? But I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you, but I <laughs> disagree. And it would be good to hear what what your so, uh, so Clive. I mean Clive is a remarkable man. There's no question about that. Clive won every battle he fought, both on the battlefield against Siraj and uh, and various other Indian rulers, but also when he came home against all the, his fellow directors of the East India Company, uh, and uh, then in Parliament. So he's this sort of brutish bully who has huge charisma. Uh, and when, in the aftermath of Buxar, the East India Company asset strips Bengal and in a sense kills the goose which has laid the golden egg. The reason they're there is the one million weavers. But by exploiting them, by, uh, by uh, short, uh, short term asset stripping and sending all the money back to England, they, they kill off Bengal. And in 1770, when the rains failed, one million Bengalis died uh, in one of the most terrible famines uh, in Indian history. And Clive does nothing. To, uh, to, to there's not a there's not a soup kitchen. In fact, he's not in India at this point, although he's set I up. I want to point out, in case people just uh, obviously photography was not big at this point in history, but I wanted to have an image <laughs> that um, sort of illustrated just the horror of it, because the, the descriptions in your book of what the famine was like was just uh, horrendous. Um, so what, I mean, you know, there are historians. I mean, I think there's a uh, I, I hugely admire Shashi Thoreau, and he's a great friend. In his book, he says that uh, there were no famines before the British came. I don't accept that. There, are, there were many famines in Indian history before the British, and there are accounts of them by Russian travelers, by uh, various other observers at different times. But, and this is the important point, pre-colonial rulers, if they were remotely uh, uh, competent, used to keep granaries for lean years. You know, obviously, if you have a good harvest, you put a little bit aside, and you keep it for, for a year when, it's, uh, when, when the, the harvest may fail. The company didn't do that. Secondly, if there is a famine, most um, uh, proper uh, uh, competent uh, Indian rulers would create famine relief measures. They, they'd build some enormous building, like, for example, the great uh, Imambara at, uh, in Lucknow. And... Uh, and give you know one rupee a day to to, to starving people so they could buy dal and rice uh, and not starve. Um, so uh, the company does nothing. There are one or two individual company servants who do set up soup kitchens. Um, one of the uh, one of the Nawab of Bengal's um, agents and partner, Shatab Rai, um, distinguishes himself by setting up a boat uh, service up to. Banaris, where there's huge quantities of grain available very cheaply, uh, and they move um, uh, they move the, the grain uh, down into Patna. But the company, is, as an institution, does not do one single soup kitchen. It's not they, they're not interested in that. They're there to make a profit. They don't see it as their job to look after the Indians. They see it uh, their job is to collect money and administer taxes. And during the famine as well, they. Uh, Am I right thinking that the taxes were still collected and the company? Am I right? I think I remember they I they, they awarded right. themselves an increase. Not just, in the not, just uh, not just uh, taxes are still collected. I mean, again, it was a typical Indian response of Indian rulers to famine that you uh, you don't collect taxes in famine years for obvious reasons. Um, but the the company, uh, as a bureaucratic organisation, says uh, uh, you must pay your taxes in full. And in this year. They actually send the sepoys out into the field uh, and um, uh, the taxes are gathered not only in full but with an extra 10 percent or something on them when the news arrives in england that um uh, the taxes have been uh, gathered in full despite the famine the shareholders of the east india company at the annual general meeting vote for an increase in their dividend from the usual 10% to 12.5%, even though they know one million Indians have died, plus the gibbets that have been set up to, uh, to hang anyone who doesn't pay their taxes in full, 
now have um, uh, now have the uh, 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 our force. There's a horrific scenes. Uh, we should move on from this uh, distressing slide. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, so I'm just going to circle back to. Um, so this was after the Battle of Buxa, I believe. Yeah. Um, so this is where sort of the East India Company sort of becomes, I don't know, becomes very powerful. So, as well. exactly. so in the, it, it, while this is all going on, the company now realizes that the game has changed. Um, in the old days, in order to buy the cotton and the silk they were going to trade with, they had to bring out a huge amount of gold bullion from London. Uh, melt it down and then pay the merchants gold and silver for the things they bought. But after the Plassey and Buxa, they realized that they could merely tax Indians land tax and use that money to buy the cotton and silk to go to trade. In other words, they get their trading goods for free. And this whole, and the model is that this should be, uh, this is a, you know, a, a massively um, profitable uh, deal. You you tax Indians, you buy cotton, you then sell the, the, the cotton around the world for a vast profit. On to that, the company comes up with a new idea, which is to start pl planting, well, first of all, indigo uh, from the 1760s, and then opium. And by the 1780s, they've become a really uh, massive narco operation. Uh, that's not an extreme description. They are the largest narco operators in history. Uh, they fight two opium wars with the Chinese, who obviously don't want um, uh, any uh, uh, opium sold in uh, uh, in their country. It's illegal to smoke opium in China, but the East India Company ignores this. It seizes Hong Kong as a base. Uh, incidentally, many Parsis and many Mawaris set up businesses joining in the opium trade. So uh, again, you've always, I think a very important thing, um, when I'm giving this talk in London, I tend to emphasize uh, the uh, violence and criminality of the East India Company. When I give the talk in India, uh, I think it's very important to emphasize the collaboration um, because it was a collaborative process. Uh, and uh, the troops that are fighting the war are Indian troops. The bankers who are lending the money are Indian bankers. And it is the Indian merchant classes who are doing extremely well out of this. After the catastrophe of the anarchy, when they couldn't move around India or sell stuff, they now suddenly find that the East India Company, whatever else it does, uh, promotes business. And Calcutta at this point is like Dubai or Singapore. You don't pay tax. It's a tax-free zone. Uh, so you get the reason the Mawaris are in Bengal to this day is that at this point they moved down en masse from outside Jodhpur uh, to Calcutta, where they set themselves up tax-free uh, operating. And they're the ones who, who finance the opium trade. So you have by the early 19th century an, um, a narcotics business uh, which makes the Medellin cartel look like Andy Pandy in the pajamas. Uh, it's just, uh, uh, I mean, it is an absolutely vast uh, thing. And what you have at this point uh, is this vast army here, all the sepoys, 200,000. I just wanted strong. to punctuate some of this well, because there, there was a lot of exploitation, all of this was going on. Um, but at the same time, these images that we're looking at are actually part of, there was a, a creative scene that was developing. And I think, just want to touch on this because the Forgotten Masters exhibition at the Wallace Collection is, is I think, closing. In Still on for another two weeks. Uh, yeah. It's on for the 16th of September. So this is Yelapa of the Law, who is very, is very heavily featured at that um, exhibition, which is fantastic. I recommend everyone go see it while they can with their masks on. Um, <laughs> But, um, but yeah, so it was, there was a, um, I guess, an artisan scene that was being... Uh, That's right. I mean, what's patronized. interesting about the East India Company is it, it, it is, you know, we're so used to the image of the Raj. The Raj only lasts 90 years, 1858 to 1947. The East India Company lasts 250 years. <clears throat> and it, there are things, you know, there are pros and cons about both periods. The Raj, you have complete racial separation. Uh, uh, east is east and west is west, never the twain shall meet. There's virtually no intermarriage. The civil lines are for the Europeans. The black towns, as they're called, are for Indians. You have the famous sign on the similar mal saying no dogs and Indians. But there is at least some notion in the Raj that universities should be built, hospitals should be built, railways should be built. There is at least some, at least window dressing, that this is, a, uh, this is meant to be a, uh, a, an empire which benefits both sides. But with the company, 
you've got none of that hypocrisy. It is very clearly there only for profit, but it shares the profits with its Indian collaborators. So you find at this point, uh, many Indian merchants joining with the company, many Indian bankers. You also find a huge amount of intermarriage. So far from the kind of East is East and West is West, uh, the, my book, White Moguls, tells the story of how at this point, one in three British men in India is married to an Indian woman. Which uh, I find very fascinating. This really, that, I mean, like I said, that was the, my first, um, the first book of yours that I read, which really just made me realize, because I think I'd really, I'd really taken on this idea that it was the Raj, 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 Raj. And I just didn't know how deep and how long the history was pre-Raj. That was something quite incredible. It, it, the figures are just, it's very simple. You know, the East India Company is founded in 1600 and carries on till 1858, which is 258 years. The Raj starts in 1858 and ends in 1947, which is 90 years. And yet for some reason, it's the Raj with Kipling and Curzon and, uh, you know, the, the, the Imperial Durbar and the Maharajas and all that stuff, which dominates in, in everyone's mind of the British and India. We think of that, uh, that Kipling image. And uh, the, the reality is, is quite other. You know, it's the East India Company, the, the, the straightforward commercial take, uh, which, which is the longer lasting. Uh, and this is the reason that there is this huge Anglo-Indian population in Calcutta at this time. Uh, Calcutta is, is about 50% Anglo-Indian in the 18th century. Uh, another so thing- we So um, I'm just conscious of time, but the, so the implications of the East India Company were not just, like, as you said, of the Opium Wars, but I think interestingly, well, it, it links to the Boston Tea Party quite directly as no, well. I, I just made an error. I said uh, Calcutta is, is, is 50%. I, sorry, that figure is not correct. I think it's 20% Anglo-Indian uh, at, at this period, uh, of, uh, an important difference. So yes, going back to, to uh, the global reach of the company. So you have, the company takes over North India. It plants opium in Bengal. It sells the opium in China. In China, it uses the profits to buy tea. The tea is shipped first to India, then to Europe, and finally to America. And it's East India Company tea that's being poured in, in Boston Harbor at the Boston Tea Party with another brilliant Jasa Alawalia slide, which I'm going to borrow for my next presentation. Uh, uh, a wonderful picture there. But yes, that is an East India Company ship, not a British government ship, uh, whose tea is being shoved into the... And one of the things that we've forgotten, uh, or the Americans have forgotten in their account of the revolution, is, um, is the role of the East India Company. And the East India Company is seen to be the demon. Uh, and there's a huge amount of uh, American anti-East India Company literature in the run-up to the Boston Tea Party, which kicks off the American Revolution. Uh, and the only person I know who's written really well on this is Emma Rothschild, the, the wife of uh, Amartya Sen. Uh, and her essays on the East India Company and the American Revolution were, were fascinating to read for me. Uh, but this, but what the, the picture you've got to get in your heads now is that the East India Company has transfor uh, transformed itself from this small Tudor half cock company that's that's always in awe of the Dutch to now the world's first massive multinational. Uh, what you put up here very nicely is the enormous sort of Buckingham Palace-like facade of the East India Company headquarters by the uh, early 19th century. And here are the director's boardroom inside. From that room, the small inset picture uh, is decided all the uh, decisions about India. So what Racecourse Road and Modi's bungalow is today, uh, that director's boardroom was by 1800. And this is when sort of shipping goes into overdrive and building. Yeah, and, yeah. exactly. So you've got two pictures of different East India Company docks. At the bottom, you've got the Masthouse and Brunswick dock, which is where all the clippers are made. And these are the clippers which will now sail out and move opium, tea and cotton around the world. And uh, there are the East India Company docks where the finished ships are loaded. Uh, and this is now, I mean, today to take this picture, uh, uh, to take a photograph of this, you'd have to stand uh, at the top floor of Canary Wharf, which almost exactly is the vantage point. I don't know whether the, the Daniels got into a balloon or something, or whether they imagined this picture and worked it out. But uh, it, that bend in the river is literally the view you get from Canary Wharf, uh, if you go up that tower. Um, so the company is now a ma the biggest taxpayer in Britain. Um, Someone just put up a question saying Amazon, Microsoft. Jeff Bezos is the very nearest equivalent to the East India Company today in the, you know, this great chunk of global trade that he controls under one single corporate head. Uh, 
uh, obviously neither Jeff Bezos nor um, uh, even Huawei uh, or um, uh, uh, Microsoft or Google or one of the big American oil companies like Exxon, Exxon on its own incidentally if it were a country um, would be the 14th biggest uh, uh, GDP in the world. But all these American companies, for all their power, do not obviously have an army bigger than the American army. While the East India Company had an army that was twice the size of the British uh, Empire. So the final question is, how does this sort of unravel? And the answer is, as always, uh, greed um, does for the, uh, the greedy. Which means and, um, the famine, which then I think links us on to, to this gentleman. And, uh... Exactly. So the famine uh, breaks out in 1770, and for two years they continue to gather uh, um, taxes at full whack, which is ultimately counterproductive because there's no seed grains to plant, the famine gets worse, uh, and uh, a million Bengalis die, uh, and it's a catastrophe. And so finally, the company actually goes uh, bankrupt. It has to go, first of all, to the Bank of England, and they can't bail it out because they, they need four million pounds. The Bank of England, which is newly founded, uh, doesn't have four million pounds. Uh, and so, meanwhile, 30 banks have collapsed across Europe, rather like the, a, a much worse version of the 2008 bank collapses. But the East India Company, unlike Lehman Brothers, is too big to fail. It provides 50% of British customs at this period, and the government needs it to survive. So the, uh, they go to Parliament and Parliament bails it out and basically takes a 50% share, rather like uh, the, uh, 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 Brown's government did with NatWest uh, and, and, create, and turn NatWest into a, a sort of semi-public private partnership. So from 1774, for the first time, the East India Company moves from being, you know, kind of libertarian wet dream, this sort of completely unregulated corporate monster that was able to do whatever it liked in India to being increasingly a government controlled organ of state. And that increases uh, from the 1774 Regulating Act, government control has increased again in the 1784 Pitts India Act. Uh, and uh, the final, uh, yes, w Warren Hastings is, uh, is sent out by the, uh, uh, is made the first governor general. He's actually a much more attractive character than Clyde. Uh, and in many ways, the wrong guy ends up being impeached by parliament. Uh, yeah, because he he's he's impeached and sort of held up as like the 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 scourge, um, but it was very much he was very much an indophile. Um, he sort of fought right. a duel yeah. with a racist. <laughs> exactly that. So um, so no, I mean uh, Warren Hastings' early letters read like Guardian editorials. He, he's fulminating against um, the uh, 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 against the injustices. Someone's just put up about Sheridan's speech at the, uh, the, at the uh, impeachment of Warren Hastings. Yes, very powerful stuff, but based on a bunch of lies told by a guy called Philip Francis, who was Warren Hastings' big enemy. They fought a duel. His, uh, Francis came back and basically framed Hastings. Hastings was not a bad guy. He, he was an Indophile. He spoke Bengali, Hindustani, Persian. He read the Bhagavad Gita. He tried to base his life on the, uh, on the Gita's teachings. He said he loved India a little more than my own country. He'd been there since the age of 16. He, he does uh, famine relief measures of, of exactly the sort that Clive failed to do. Uh, and he uh, tries very hard to rein in the, uh, the avarice of many of the company's uh, 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 factors. Nonetheless, he is you know, in charge of the company and the company is deeply extractive and uh, he fights a long, hard battle in, uh, for his, uh, during his impeachment, and after 10 years, he is acquitted of all charges. But by this stage, the government's claws are firmly into this uh, corporation. By the 1830s, the, 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 the East India Company no longer trades. First of all, it loses its monopoly, then it stops trading and becomes merely a governing corporation, rather like the BBC, uh, the British Broadcasting Corporation, which is one of the last corporations of this sort left. And um, then in 1857, there is the great uprising, not by the, initially by the people of India, not by the Marathas, least of all by the Sikhs, who by this stage are now re being recruited into the East India Company uh, armies. Uh, it is the, the, largely the Hindu sepoys who rise up and they put a Mughal emperor on the throne, Bahadur Shah Zafar, 
uh, is the nominal figurehead of this uprising, even though he's a peaceable 82-year-old poet at this point. And uh, with the companies when... were being rebelled against here, not the British government as such. Exactly. And it's, the, and it's led by the East India Company's own sequence. Although there are, particularly in luck now, it turns into a mass uprising. I mean, the, the 1857 uprising is a very complicated thing. It's different things in different places. Mm -hmm. uh, if, for example, it's quite different in, in Delhi, where the, the sepoys are seen as outsiders and they're called Talingas, as if they're from Talangana, um, uh, although most of them are just from Bihar, in fact. But, they, they, you know, they're rather like uh, Delhi Wallers today, regard Bihari as a slightly sort of hairy uh, out, outliers from the, from the boonies. Uh, so the posh Delhi Wallers like Ghalib look with horror on these, uh, uh, on these sepoys coming in, while in Lucknow they're local boys and the whole population joins them. So it's a complicated thing that happens in 1858, and we won't go at 57 to 8, and we won't go into it now. But the main it's point is here. That's the main it, thing. Yeah, it's crushed, it's put down with terrible brutality. Uh, and um, about 100,000 people are killed, particularly in the Ganges Basin, particularly between Kanpur, Lucknow, and Delhi. Uh, there is mass slaughter of innocent civilians and terrible, terrible uh, uh, retribution. For example, innocent bypassers in Kanpur are made to lick up the blood of the slaughtered memsabs in, in the room where they were killed. This sort of, I mean, it's one of the dark, it's the, it's the nearest you get to the British behaving like, like Nazi stormtroopers. Uh, and I no I found can... really quite shocking is to discover Sikh complicity in these acts of um, torture and violence. That was something that reading The Last Mogul I was really st struck by. Um, I know it's not particularly, you, you don't dive into the history of Punjab or the Sikhs, but I was wondering kind of what was the, the real, why were the Sikhs so um, involved and why did they support the company? So it's a complicated story again, and uh, I'm probably the wrong person to answer the question. But my understanding is that the Sikhs had uh, a huge dislike of the Hindu sepoys who had been part of the, who'd, who'd, who'd done the atrocities in the Punjab during the, uh, in the aftermath of the two Sikh wars. Uh, whatever the reason, whatever the, um, however you want to explain it, the fact was that the Sikhs remained loyal to the East India Company, who they'd fought only 10 years before. Uh, the Second Anglo-Sikh Wars, what, 1842? Uh, uh, you know, know, this, know this better than I. Uh, and this second is 18, 1848 to 49. 1848. So this is only, yeah, I mean, 50, this is literally nine years earlier. And I think second. it's new because I think the Anglo Sikh wars are largely forgotten because the mutiny came to dominate the, the popular consciousness at this time. So, I mean, it is a surprise that, you know, this, this is literally eight, nine years after the second Anglo Sikh war, and yet the Sikhs remain loyal to the company and don't join the Hindu sepoys. Now, I, I can't explain that, but that is what happened. And certainly um, there is um, account uh, uh, out there, uh, eyewitness accounts of many of the, for example, Mughal. I think, I think the other thing was that it was, you know, uh, the Indian nationalist accounts of 1857 have slightly written out the central role of the Mughals, uh, at least as, as nominal figureheads. Because and you refer to it in your book as the uprising. You don't call it a rebellion, mutiny, war of independence. It's, I just try and avoid the, uh, the yeah, it's, it's a very politicised thing. It's rather like the sort of Aryan invasion debate. No one right. can sort of take a neutral stance. I, I, I sidestepped it and just called it the uprising, <laughs> the great uprising. Um, but and the, is this, yeah. um, sorry, I'm just very conscious of time. I know people will have questions. But um, the uprising was essentially then what, what spelt the end of the East India Company. Yeah, I mean, such is the fiasco, such is the death and uh, mayhem and destruction. The British press mainly obviously concentrates on the, on the, on the mayhem and destruction to British people. Uh, but uh, there is some uh, reporting by William Howard Russell of the Times of the massive Indian death uh, toll uh, during this period and, and the shooting blowing from the mouths of cannon uh, of, the, of the, the people that the British describe as mutineers. And in 1858, in reaction to this fiasco, Parliament votes to uh, effectively nationalize the East India Company. And uh, at the same place where the Diwani was signed between Shah Alam and 
Robert Clive in that painting we saw at the beginning of the talk, um, the, uh, the Governor General declares the end of the East India Company and the beginning of the direct rule as a British colony in the Raj. But as we said, this only lasts 90 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and by 1947, uh, India is free. So this is, yeah, the, the timeline that we can see how it all ends. 39 to 42, first uh, Anglo-Afghan War, 45 to 46, first Anglo-Sikh War, 48, 49, second Anglo-Sikh War. Just on the um, yeah. Anglo-Afghan War, because yeah. this is something where uh, some of the Sikh history co comes into it in your book, um, Return of a King. Um, it's how the Sikhs came to have ownership of the Kuinur, and it's also, I think, the strength of Ranjit Singh and the Sikh Empire at this time is what really frustrated the the, the outset of the uh, Anglo-Sikh War, um, sorry, the Ang Anglo-Afghan War as well. Um, I was just curious as to what those, if we just touched on those briefly before. Correct. We... I mean, I, 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 I have always promised myself that at some point I must write a proper Sikh book and, uh, and the court of Ranjit Singh is such an inviting subject to write about. Uh, and there's so much material between India, Pakistan, and uh, uh, and London that uh, it, it would be a, a, a wonderful project for the future. Um, uh, but at the moment, yes, I'm afraid I'm, I'm a researcher. The, uh, the Sikhs are, the Sikhs are on, on the edge of my of, of my of my genre rather than at the centre. So forgive me for uh, uh, for not being better versed in my Sikh history, everyone. But it was the. Um... So, because the the Kuino was in Afghanistan at that time, and then um, so yeah, the so Kuino the Kuino is originally first turns up. There's all sorts of legends about the Kuino, and um, it's very interesting to do a kind of proper fact check, which is what this book uh, that Anita Anand and I co-wrote. Um, uh, the reality is there's not a single hundred percent clear reference to the Kuino before it's recorded being part of the Peacock Throne of Shah Jahan. Uh, it could have been the stone that Babur found. It might not have been. It could have been various other stones that are recorded in history, some at Vijayanaga, some at uh, various other places. Uh, but it turns up in the Peacock Throne, and it's taken by Nadir Shah. Uh, when Nadir Shah is killed, uh, it ends up with Ahmed Shah Abdali, who founds the first Afghan state. Uh, it goes from Ahmed Shah Abdali to his son, to his grandson, who is Shah Shuja, and Shah Shuja is sprung from prison in Kashmir by Ranjit Singh. And the deal he's made with, with uh, Shah Shuja's wife uh, 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 is that um, in return, the Kohinoor will be handed over. Now, uh, when, when Shah Shuja hears this, he's horrified, doesn't want to give the, um, uh, the, the diamond at all. But according to him, and, and you can you know, choose to uh, uh, believe that he was not telling the truth or not, as you wish, but according to his memoirs very clearly, Ranjit Singh tortured his son in front of him until he handed it over. So eventually he hands it over to, uh, to Ranjit Singh, and Ranjit Singh, who doesn't normally like finery, he is very simple, you know, at a time when people wear these magnificent kit, Ranjit Singh's often in very simple white pajamas, but the thing he loves is the uh, is the Kohinoor, and he wears it for all big important state occasions, and that's the first time the British see it on his arm, particularly on occasions such as uh, when the Elphinstone mission is received in Peshawar uh, in, I think, uh, 1807, and then again when um, in, in the run-up to the, to the Anglo-Afghan War of 1839, uh, when they had the big Darbar at Ferozpur and the, and the Sikh and East India Company armies parade together. Uh, then he wears it, and Emily Eden has shown it, uh, and it, this creates, in a sense, the appetite among the British to seize this this stone, which incidentally was not at all at the centre of Mughal um, uh, dreams. The, there is no clear reference to the Kohinoor that I've been able to find uh, in Mughal sources. The first time we really get to hear about it uh, is when Nadir Shah takes it, and the Persians make a fuss of it. Um, then Nadi, uh, then uh, uh, Amit Shah Abdali writes, uh, a lot of the sources from his brain talk about it, and finally um, Ranjit Singh is obsessed with it. Uh, and so when the British get it with Dalhousie, finally, uh, uh, after the Treaty of, uh, of Lahore, uh, Dalhousie, who's the kind of Boris Johnson of his day, he's this sort of smarmy Etonian um, who is 
Foreign Secretary, uh, sorry, is, is Governor General, wants to be Foreign Secretary and Prime Minister. And he, without telling the East India Company, puts a clause into the Treaty of Lahore saying that the diamond known as the Kohinoor shall go to the Queen. Now, his bosses, the East India Company, are hopping mad at this because they rather fancied the Kohinoor for themselves. <laughs> um, but, when, but, when, but with the news that he's defeated uh, uh, Dulip Singh uh, and the Sikhs, comes the news that it's the Queen that's going to get it. Obviously, what he wants to do is he wants the Queen to make him Prime Minister. Uh, as a thank you president, uh, and indeed uh, this is what he, he's up. He only gets as far as foreign secretary, unlike Boris Johnson, uh, as we all know to our cost now. Anyway, that's mm. a side. How but, do you feel about the stone? Where, cause, am I right in thinking the Queen, our, our current Queen, has never actually worn it? Correct. Um, the last time it was worn was by the, um, was, well, it was on the Queen Mother's crown. Mm -hmm. um, and it was at her uh, laying in state. People that went to that laying in at Westminster Hall described how in the twilight of Westminster Hall with the coffin at the end of the room, uh, in the dying light of day, the Kohinoor still had the capacity to fill the room with, with, with light. It, it, it caught the dying mm -hmm. sun in Westminster Hall, beamed out this sort of magical light. Uh, mm -hmm. So it still has its own power dividing and... Uh, uh, and destroying and uh, creating envy. There are currently five governments after it, not just India, but also Pakistan, Bangladesh, the Afghans, and the Taliban. Mullah Omar's last act was to post a letter to the Queen asking for the Kohinoor, because <laughs> Amit Sharandali had from his cave. Given, given the sort of death and destruction that follows it, it seems odd that anybody would be, be wanting to get their hands back on it, to be honest. Well, exactly. Uh, it, it, has, it has this fantastic ability to create mayhem wherever it goes. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, next up, Camilla Parker Bowles. If she, if she becomes queen, she'll be wearing it. So uh, let's see what happens to the royal family at that point. Well, it seems we've got up to the present day, which seems maybe um, a good time to open <laughs> it up to uh, our present day viewers um, and some questions. Look at that. Seamless transition. Um, let's let's uh, let's open it up to questions. I mean, I've got a few to fill gaps, but I don't think we're going to have many gaps. Um, I I don't know if I have the control over letting people um, answer. Like, I I can't see a thing for. Uh, um, no, I'm not sure. I mean, you might need to. Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, just so it's Amon here. Um, why don't you take some of the typed questions and then okay. in the meantime if anyone wants to ask a question put your hand up on the on um the app and then uh we'll, we'll try to call out some names in a bit just so but okay. why don't you go with the typed questions first great i'm, I'm going to dive straight in firstly with the with the top voted one um before i um, haven't had a chance to really look through these yet but uh Robin Percival says, Boris Johnson says, I think it's time we stopped our cringing embarrassment about our history, about our traditions and about our culture. And we stopped this general fight of self-recrimination and wetness. <laughs> do you think he has people like you in mind when he said this? And more importantly, do you agree? Well, I've never said this in public, but I know that his father, Stanley, got the anarchy for his, for his birthday when he was at Czech, so he might well have me in mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I used to write for Boris occasionally when he was at the Spectator, and I'm no fan, so uh, uh, we fell out over his uh, support for Israel. He wouldn't, uh, he was blocking uh, pro-Palestinian writers from writing, so uh, uh, I'm not surprised at the mess the country's in now. All right, but, but I mean, his, but you said his brother was uh, somebody that you're... Uh, you... Joe is a great friend, yeah. Anyway, yeah. We, should, we should move on from these personal uh, <laughs> sure moving on okay um what are williams thoughts about the top of the racist campaign some of their targets do indeed include statues like colston those directly linked with the slave trade colonialism others less so and are perhaps less culpable like the memorial to sir walter Raleigh gilbert in bodmin beacon a british army officer from the 19th uh, century I, I believe this might be a uh, hardik who um wrote uh, recently for the spectator about this statue in particular i think it's interesting yeah because there are you know what point where are we celebrating are we remembering is it documentation history where, where do those lines where do you feel those lines um need to be drawn okay so you put up that um article that i'd uh, written in the spectator saying the clive statue should come down I, I mean i think clive is a particularly clear case because 
he was someone who was despised at the time for his greed, his insider trading, his ruthlessness. Uh, and the statue is 140 years after his death. It was put up by Curzon. So it's not like he was a hero at the time. He was regarded, he was called Lord Vulture at the time. Uh, and it shouldn't be outside the Foreign Office, nor should it be at the back entrance of Downing Street. Uh, this is not a national hero by any means. This is a deeply ruthless, corrupt corporate villain. I mean, he, in my book, he's very much kind of the Lord Voldemort of the piece. He, he, he's a very dodgy character. So um, I would certainly take Clive down. I mean, I think what this country really badly needs is a very good, balanced museum of colonialism. Uh, and um, the, I was recently in Washington, and there's a spectacular museum at the African American Museum there has the most moving and brilliant and balanced display about slavery. And that is full of statues of slavers and of uh, slaving memorabilia. And, you know, I think you could happily take down a few uh, statues in very prominent places of East India Company magnates and create a really good museum out of it and teach people the history of colonialism, uh, the bad stuff, but also, you know, some of the stuff we can be more proud of, like, you know, James Princep translating the Ashoka uh, script and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, the, the rediscovery of, of, of India's Buddhist past and this kind of thing. You know, there are, it's not as if it's an unmitigated history of complete horror. Uh, there are things the British people could be proud of in, in their history, but nonetheless, they need to know the really nasty stuff, which they're not being taught. So my, my view would be to take down some of the statues and help, and, and help find, a, I mean, there's, you know, a new site in the East End that uh, the v &A is opening up uh, called uh, v &A East. If, if something like that could be found to start a really good museum of colonialism modeled on the America, African-American museum. And it's the same thing in that, why is there an African-American museum in Washington? Because it's central to the identity of African-Americans. In the same way, every brown person in this country uh, is confronted by a statue like Clive sitting outside the foreign office. It is not an easy thing to live with, particularly if it isn't mediated by a modern plaque explaining in a balanced way both sides of the story. Um, so my, my, my strong feeling is that we need to take some of these things down, create a good museum and find a way through the very difficult, uh, difficult way of, of, of presenting a past that modern Britain can un uh, allow modern Britain to understand their place in the world, what they've done, what their forebears done, and then move on in the way that the Germans have. Mm -hmm. um, and we are not doing that. Uh, at the moment, we have this huge romance about the Raj. And we, you know, the British understand that the Belgian Empire was something hideously evil, where people had their arms cut off, they didn't cut a certain amount of uh, rubber a day. People understand that the German colonies in East Africa were hideously exploitative, and obviously the Third Reich was worse. But they somehow um, still believe that you know, the British was one enormous big merchant ivory film writ large over the plains of Hindustan with smiling Maharajas, uh, and lovely elephants and people playing croquet and having tea and nice, you know, British ladies in crinolines under parasols sweeping over lawns. And it turned into some sort of spectacular romance. And the reality that this was about exploitation. No empire ever has been built for the benefit of the colonized. Every empire is built for the benefit of the, of the colonist whether it's the, the, the English in Ireland, whether it's the Dutch in the East Indies, whether it's the Romans in Gaul, it's the same story. Uh, and the British have just got to get a bit real about this. Uh, and I think, I think it's actually terribly important. I think it's a major issue of our time. And I say, this is the reason really I wrote the book. Right. Well, let's take some questions um, from people over the, uh, over the phone, I don't know, over the internet. Um, so I'm going to open up the chat. Um, let's go first to, uh, I think, Suresh. Uh, he's got his hand up. Um, I'm just going to open up the chat. Suresh, I think you... Oh, hang on. I don't know how to do... Hi. That. Oh, there. Is that working? I, 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 do, I just have one question. C can you hear me? I yeah. can hear me but not see you. I can just see a big Q&A in front of me. That's fine. If, if you can hear me, that's enough. <laughs> that's the, like William, the question I have for you is... Oh, I've got if, you now. If Bonaparte's, if Napoleon Bonaparte's reinforcements had reached Tipu Sultan in time for him to be able to defeat the British, 
is there any likelihood uh, that India could have progressed to be a French colony than an English colony? Was that a critical well, battle there? I think one of the things that might have happened would be one of the great culinary enterprises of history. If you look at French colonies like Lebanon, the uh, delicious food when you get French chefs meeting with Arab chefs, the, uh, can you imagine what might have happened in, uh, in, in, in Indian cooking? But uh, uh, that sort of counterfactual is great fun. I don't know whether one could ever really guess what actually would have happened. I mean, I think there's every reason to believe that had Napoleon got to India, he could have toppled the company. The question then, though, is would he have given India freedom? The chances are probably not. Uh, he would have just added it to the French Empire. So I don't think anyone would have been much further forward. Okay, the only other question, I, well, not a question, but more a statement is, you know, um, after reading your book, I, I looked up the word conniving. <laughs> Uh, as as in the, in the Oxford Dictionary and, and the description it says is somebody doing things uh, to benefit themselves at the price of the others. I mean, would you regard the British as, as a conniving people or a conniving race? Uh, you know, and if so, what is it that you might attribute that characteristic to? I'm not a great believer in, in sort of national stereotypes. I don't believe, you know, the French are fantastic lovers, but wear onions around their necks, or that, uh, uh, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> the Polish are uh, stupid, or, you know, I don't think you can make generalized, or the Scots are mean. I'm a Scotsman. I'm, 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 I'm enormously spendthrift, to be honest. So, um, I, I, I don't know. I think I, I don't believe that you, know, you can you can make generalizations that are true about a whole people. I think you know nations are made up of groups of individuals. Um, what you can say though is that um, the British Empire is really like any other empire. It was done for the benefit of the colonizers, and just like the Dutch, Portuguese. Um, even if you go back in uh, in in Indian history, look at the Chola navies raiding Sumatra. Malaya and Sri Lanka um, in order to uh, get dominance of the trade of the Bay of Bengal in the in the 12th century. Uh, most nations when they are strong have used that strength to enrich themselves and that seems to me to be a constant in history. Um, so I don't think that you can point to a particular characteristic in the British character and say that's the reason the British Empire happened. The reason the British Empire happened was that the British had a period of strength that lasted about 300 or 250 years, uh, and they did exactly the same as the Romans and every other people, the Spanish, uh, who've ever had power, the, the, the Han Chinese, uh, the Tang Chinese, you know, they, they extended their power over those that were militarily weaker than them, and they, and they exploited them. Uh, it's not... William Last, William Last uh, not, not a question, but just an observation. Are you aware that the Scots tried to copy the British and tried uh, in an attempt to colonize uh, Panama? In fact, they even set up, a, they set up a company along the lines of the East India Company. And the whole, whole attempt was a total disaster. I am aware. No, very, it's, I mean, it, it, for, for us Scots, the Darien, the Darien scheme is, is an essential part of our history because it was the catastrophe of Darien that propelled the Scottish elite, with, some, with my family among them, uh, to sign the Act of Union and in 1707 join uh, uh, to create uh, the British uh, Kingdom. Uh, it, wasn't the, it wasn't the British who uh, kept the Scots out of, uh, out of the East India Company, it was the English. And the British became the British in 1707 at the Act of Union. Um, uh, but yes, no, you're quite right. It's a crucial moment. And the failure of the Scots to do their own colony was very much uh, one of the uh, reasons for the East India Company. And one of the things that lured the Scottish elite to agreeing to the union was the promise of, of, of uh, uh, opportunities and patronage in the East India Company. Thank you very much, Suresh. Um, there's a question that I've just spotted in the, um, the Q&A, the written Q&A, which is, what was the relationship like between Christian missionaries and the East India Company before and after the Charter Act 1813 from Dejbal Singh, um, which I think I've, I've 
I think is included and comes up in White Moguls, which I found particularly, because that's a really fascinating period where there's this cultural exchange, coexistence. I mean, I feel like class was very much still a thing, um, but race wasn't really as influential. Um, it was almost like, it feels like racism emerged as a technology in much the way that the Flintlock musket did. Um, I was wondering if you could just like offer some insight into that, <laughs> nice, that period of time. Nice yes, yeah, so um, I, we have in the British Library in London all the wills of all the Brits that went out to India with the East India Company, and you can read every single one of them. The reason they're there is that there used to be so many squabbles over the, the estates. You know, a guy would die in Bengal of smallpox or cholera and all his relations suddenly want the money and there'd be endless arguments. So the company came up with this thing whereby you send a will back and those are kept in large leather bound volumes in the British Library and you can look at them. Now, they're, in, they're bound in 10 year groups and I spent six months going through every single one uh, when I was, in 1999 when I was beginning White Moguls. And in 1760 to 1780, one in three Brits is leaving everything to an Anglo-Indian child or a uh, Indian woman. Um, 1800 to 1810, it's about one in four. 1810 to uh, 1820, it's about one in five. And by 1830 to 1840, there are almost no Indian women mentioned in wills. Uh, it's, it's fallen out. So that kind of cohabitation uh, uh, ends. Why did it end? Partly because of the missionaries. And around the time of the Charter Act, uh, the, the missionaries begin to get active. And uh, the missionaries who were initially discouraged and who are then again discouraged during the Raj have this great moment of uh, freedom to preach and uh, collaboration with the East India Company between about 1820 and 1850. The result is the uprising. And it is fear of conversion. Uh, more than anything else, certainly in the Delhi stuff that I've read. Um, I haven't studied Lucknow and, and the other centers, but I've studied Delhi uh, very closely in the last Mughal. And the what's called the Mutiny Papers, which is the, the basically the paperwork of the mutineers in Delhi, which survives in the Indian National Archives, is very clear about the deep fear of missionaries, which uh, existed in every Indian community. Uh, and it was a major reason for the uprising. It wasn't what the only I, reason, but what it was fascinating as well. Is that is it? Am I right in thinking that the the sort of this this Christ, um, sort of missionary activity, this renewed interest in Christianity, while it was sort of fueling division and racism in India, was also sort of what led to the abolition of slavery as well at the same time. So the, the sort it's of a measure of, bizarre... of the complexity of history. The same evangelicals who wants um, slaves free. Why? So that they can be free to choose Jesus. That's the, that's the thinking. Mm. Uh, according to Christian theology, you can't have Christianity forced on you. You have to freely choose it. So uh, one of the things that, that motivated Wilberforce, though you don't see this obviously in the films and things, which are, mm. you know, it, 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 they make it look like a stirring human rights, uh, you know, civil rights movement. Um, but the, uh, um, one of the things that motivated a lot of the evangelicals to support the liberation of the slaves was the opportunity to preach to them after they were free. Yeah. Um, and uh, those same people are pressing for uh, the conversion often by force. Um, I mean, sorry, sorry, that's a contradiction. Terms. There are those who believe that, uh, that the, the company should play an active role in, uh, in, in helping missionaries preach so you get a few outliers like um collectors at cantonments putting up the ten commandments in hindi and urdu outside their uh outside their offices you get generals and, and uh, corporals preaching to uh sepoys on parade uh, about the wonders of christianity mm. uh, and this is the sort of thing which leads to the sepoys becoming very uneasy because rumors spread that they're going to be made to uh, to eat pork and uh, and and uh, uh, and, and uh, kill cows and, uh, and the, the famous greased cartridges, which uh, which were rumored to be greased with pork fat and cow fat, uh, and 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 was enough to uh, terrify any pious uh, sepoy, whatever his faith. 
So this is a this is a uh, uh, this is a very real issue. Uh, and then I think the uh, one of the lessons that the, the British government and the Raj draws from is to restrict the activities of missionaries in the, uh, after 1858. They're never banned, but they're put under severe constraint. Right. Um, I've just realised we've come up to we're, we're well past uh, six thirty now, so we might be uh, less time. I'm ready for a drink. I don't know about you, Jessa. Sorry, <laughs> I'm ready for a drink. <laughs> you want, if we just take one last question. Uh, I know Serena has been waiting um, eagerly, and uh, we'll take one last question, and then we'll um, yeah we'll crack open a bottle. <laughs> Serena, are you there? Oh yeah, I'm here. Hey. Hello, Hi. Serena. Hi. Um... So yeah, so my question's, um, well, how do you think institutions like museums can tackle the narrative of empire? Because, you know, growing up, I didn't actually learn anything about empire or India's contribution to things like the world war. So, you know, it feels quite empty and you don't recognize, there's no recognition for, you know, for, for the empire, for parts of the empire. And um, the question kind of comes about because, um, when I went to the Natural History Museum this year in January, I saw a placard of the Kohinoor diamond that was being kept there temporarily. And it said it was given to Queen Victoria in 1850, but there's so much, such a lack of context there that, you know, I, I wasn't impressed with it. And actually that, that makes people, like people don't want to then investigate because they're quite satisfied with that answer that it was just given to Queen Victoria. So how do you think, um, large institutions like museums can tackle uh, the empire I mean, narrative. Technically speaking, it was given to Queen Victoria, but by the East India Company, who had yeah. taken, it by, taken it by force from uh, <laughs> poor D. Lip Singh at the age of yeah. whatever he was, nine. Um, so, it's, it, I mean, as I said, my, my um, model for this would be the uh, African American Museum in Washington, which, right. you know, uh, does just as difficult a task of of finding a way through a political morass mm. and uh, uh, uh you know the most in america obviously you know the racial issue is one of the most important fault lines uh in american society and yet this museum has found a way through i've i've met right wing friends uh very conservative uh people who've gone to that museum and broken down in tears at what they saw mm. And it's done not by bludgeoning people with with horror, but it's done with great subtlety. And uh, if uh, if I mean uh, it, that encouraged me to believe that you can create a narrative that everyone can subscribe to. I mean, in a sense, that's also what I've been trying to do with the anarchy. Yeah. Um, and I've been very pleased to see that you know it was. I think if you if you get it right, you can find a narrative that that will satisfy an Indian audience, but will also explain things to a pretty ignorant British audience. Yeah. And I think I was lucky that, in a sense, everyone understands the fear of corporations. We live in a time when we're very worried about the power of Jeff Bezos and Google and so on. <laughs> and because the Brits just didn't, haven't taken in that this was a corporate enterprise, in a sense, they didn't have their defences up against it. You see what I'm trying to say? That they, yeah. that, that by seeing it as a a, a corporate issue, mm. yeah. rather than directly the responsibility of the British people and government, mm. the British were able to take on board the atrocities which took place, and to look on it with a measure of objectivity. So I don't think it's impossible to create a narrative which can uh, which can be accepted by both sides. I think it can be done. Um, and exactly. um, and I think it's very important that it happens. I mean, I, I mean, I really, really believe that uh, Boris Johnson's government, people like Michael Gove, mm. and Theresa May, represent a huge swathe of British opinion that just doesn't know about this stuff. And Boris can talk all he likes about you know wet liberals and bedwetters, or I don't, I don't know what language he <laughs> used was, but but. Um, Frankly, that just represents his ignorance. He's mm. not a historian. He, you know, he knows his classics, uh, and he's pretty good on the age of Augustus. But I wish he knew a bit more about the age of Clive and the age of Queen Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think William, your book's um, probably going a long way to um, to help. But Stanley gives him the book back. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, we're, I guess we, we need to call it a day. Um, we're, thank you very much for uh, thank, giving us so thank much. You, Arman, thank you, Arman. Step three, Kalji. Thank you, Jasa. Thank you, Arman. Thank you very much. Amandeep, um, would you like to jump back on just to say a few words about the, um, the, uh, the, the, the prize, the prizes? What is it? The books, the, the, the giveaway um, and what people need the to giveaway do. Giveaway books. It's, the survey's gone up multiple times. I'm not going to keep you. I'm not going to keep William any longer. Th William, thank you so much indeed. That was a marathon uh, <laughs> session. Enjoyed every single minute of it. Uh, You're very good, sir. Thank you. So much. You very kind. Jasper, you were amazing. Thank you. Thank, thank you I much. want those slides. I'm going to steal those slides. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send them over. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.